All right, so what we were doing a moment ago, we're searching for our name, searching for our company name, searching for a keyword of our business. Now, let's do another fourth kind of search. We saw here, by doing a very generic keyword search, we're a needle in a haystack. A little needle in a big haystack. Nowadays, if someone were trying to find you, perhaps, they're going to be more specific. Nowadays, people are going to be maybe a little more savvy. And when they search, they're a little bit more detailed. So let's do a search. And this time, I'll do something like affordable web design for lawyers. Again, it might be giving you suggestions. You can ignore them for the moment. But I'm going to be a little more specific. Let's say I'm a lawyer, and I want a website. So I would search for affordable web design for lawyers. Let's try that kind of search on both search engines. Google gives me 998,000 results. Bing gives me 2.4 million results. The, first, the, the two search engines will, of course, first give me an ad. Uh, I don't seem to be seeing the local result like I did a moment ago over on Bing. The top result is scorpion.co. I don't know, but that name doesn't really instill me with a lot of confidence. But Scorpio, scorpion.co is the first result they paid for it. Then we've got Foster Web Marketing, Skywax, Law Firm Marketing 360.com. Over on Bing, Scorpio is number one again. With a lot more to look at, such as what our clients say. It's literally been the difference between success and failure. That's a good endorsement. Better than their name. So um, Bing is showing it a little different. Then the next result is amicuscreative.com. Amicus is a keyword that uh, lawyers use, so they're on, on point. And further, it goes on to sma2z.com, and then thoughtstopaper.com. Okay, ads. Again, we're going to get ads on both of these. We're going to see ads more and more and more. Yes? If you're on my search, it's interesting. Ads are not coming up until page two, like the spotlight hmm. and some other stuff. And then ads. What would be the reason for that? It's going to depend on what you're searching for, your keywords, okay. and a variety of factors. So, ads don't always come up first. Exactly. It, this really changes in a variety of ways. The algorithm, the technique to show the results, can easily show you different results. I'm going to skip the ads for both Bing and Google, and then I'm going to see some organic results. Those are the non-paid results. I like at least that on Bing, even though they don't make it as obvious that this is an ad, I like that at least they put a little line right there. It's still kind of subtle, but they're putting a line there, and I guess that means the ads are done. I'm not seeing that on Google. I am seeing them as obviously marked as ads, but then the organic stuff starts, and it doesn't exactly show it obviously. So again, each engine believes they're showing the best results. They're both crawling the <laughs> same internet. They're both browsing the same internet, but they feel they have each one has its own best results. Even subtle things, such as just looking at it like this from a distance. I kind of think this one on the right is a little easier to read. The words are a little larger and bolder compared to here. Even basic subtle things like that cause people to click or not. All right, so I get themodernfirm.com on Google, attorney website design. And over on Bing, I get silverscopedesign.com, law firm web design for attorneys. So um, some people are going to click on the first result because it's at the top, but it's an ad. So we are going to skip that and go to the organic result. Again, we're going to focus on organic. And the kind of search now, perhaps, <coughs> I'm still, if, well, I should have done it like this. Um, I was searching web design a moment ago. I'm going to search for affordable web designers in San Diego. You don't have to do this, but what I meant to do was if I searched like this and I said my company does web design, and if I browse here, I don't see my company. What I'm getting at here is, again, needle in a haystack. I had a billion results a moment to go on Bing. Now I've got 900 and 3 million. 
I had like two, I had like 400 million results on Google a moment ago. Now I've got two million. Yes. In theory, yes, because I also specified San Diego. Depending on how I search, then uh, that's what these results are going to be based on. So because I said San Diego, in theory, these are results of San Diego. This doesn't mean that there's two million web designers in San Diego. This will still probably also pick up things like a Twitter account, a Yelp review, a Facebook page. So everything that it finds related to affordable web designers in San Diego. Could, could a, um, an advertiser also target San Diego? Yes, definitely. We can target our ads and such to really be focused. Um, whereas I put a billboard out on the 5, it's just going to be on the 5. But on Google and Bing, I can make an ad that can be shown specifically to certain demographics that I want. So in a sense, that's much better than putting that ad out in the real world. So this kind of search is the kind of search that we're going to focus on to get found. You're not going to get found with the basic keyword of web design, but you have a better chance of getting found with the keyword of affordable web designers in San Diego, a more specific search. So making our notes here, hard to be found, basic keywords. Easier, I didn't say easy, easier to be found, because none of this is ever guaranteed. Uh, what is known as the long tail keyword. Yes? So one company online when they put serving, they put like 10 cities there. Where on their website would they put all those cities? Because I quickly glanced, I didn't see their list, so is it like embedded somewhere? Uh, somewhere within the site, it could be in a meta tag, it could be in a sub page, like an about page, not just on the home page. Right. But their content somewhere yeah. shows that, and we see it on the search result. That's pretty so the hard way to be found is by using the basic keywords, the one that everyone's the, the one that's every, everyone's using and everyone has been using, the ones that are going to make it harder for you to be found because Yelp uses it, or Wikipedia uses it, or webdesigner.com uses it, that basic keyword is a lot harder to be found. Everyone's using it. So a long tail keyword, a more specific keyword, is what will help you get what will help you get found. So specific keywords, that's another way to say it. Because more people are searching specifically, like I just did right here, you're probably doing it too. A little while ago when I said for you to search, you might have already started to search with a zip code and all of that. And I said, don't get too fancy yet. Just search a keyword. Maybe you're getting more savvy and being more specific when you search. More people are getting savvier to be specific. More people are also doing this. What's a good taco shop nearby? It said, here are 10 taco shops nearby that have good reviews. I asked it a normal, uh, natural language, human type question, and then the machine, the search engine, searched locally. It understood that because I have GPS on this, and it looked around locally, and it's telling me, here's the best ones because they have good Yelp reviews. And my result here shows less than one mile away on 8690 Arrow Drive is La Fuente Mexican food, four stars, 123 Yelp reviews. Also, over on Ashford Street is El Esmeralda's Taco Shop, four and a half stars. Lolita's Taco Shop, 1.8 miles away, 1,737 Yelp reviews. This sort of natural language question that I asked my phone, and all of them have it now. This is a this is a Windows phone. I just asked Cortana. You're gonna ask your i. You're gonna ask Siri if you've got an iPhone. You're gonna ask uh, Google if you've got an Android. But now more people are gonna ask a question like a person person to person on their phone and more people are going to be specific on the search engine like this you may already be doing it in a variation maybe you search for web designer 91914 that's still being specific that's what we're going to focus on long tail keywords getting found 
by people that are searching specifically. Because the web, websites have been around about 27 years. The internet has been around longer, <coughs> since the 60s. Websites have been around since about 1989, 27 years. And in that time, think about how long you've used the internet websites. Think about how you've searched, and think about how it didn't give you good results when you just typed, you know, Italian restaurant. But when you searched for authentic Italian restaurant, or when you searched for new bakeries in 91912, when you yourself probably are getting more specific and savvy searching, so is everyone else, as we use the web more and more and more. So we need to think about getting found this way. It's a long tail keywords. The best way to explain why it's long tail is with a little drawing right here. I'm going to put my drawing in the network folder at the end of the day. But this is a good way to uh, explain what I'm saying about long tail keywords. I'm going to draw a simple X and Y axes. On the bottom I'll put keyword on the vertical I'll put frequency and then I'll draw a line that looks something like this This is my excuse to use our high-tech $5,000 monitor. Um, a line that goes like this, that tapers off. Maybe never reaching zero down here, but just getting smaller. What this means is there are going to be some keywords that are used a lot on a website, on a search. There are some keywords that are going to be used less often on a website or in search. There are some keywords that are going to be used very little. So the long tail keyword strategy is to think about keywords that less people are using. So that I'm not such a little needle in a big haystack. I'm probably still going to be a needle in a haystack to some degree, but a smaller needle, I mean a bigger needle in a smaller haystack, as opposed to a big one over here. The long tail is just that, you know, imagine that the rest of the chart on the left side over here is a cow, and here's its tail. The long tail keyword strategy. So nowadays, modern SEO is about the long tail keyword strategy. What are the more detailed, more specific keywords that people are searching for? Once we identify those, we then apply them to our website to help us get found easier. Again, just by doing a long tail keyword in our website doesn't guarantee you'll be number one, because I can never guarantee SEO. I can always say probably and possibly and usually, but I can't guarantee. Yes? Think about it yourself. Are you using, when you search for things, are you searching for such a huge pool of results. I want to find a brand new restaurant. And if I simply search restaurant, I could get a result in New York. But I want at least a restaurant in Pacific Beach. I'm still being specific. So if my website simply has the keyword restaurant, I'm going to get by, found possibly by someone in Kansas. But if my website has a keyword of Pacific Beach restaurant, and someone searches Pacific Beach restaurant, that's still a long tail keyword. And that could be easier for me to get found. Well, I don't think anyone goes and Google type restaurant or yacht. You can use a yacht broker, San Diego. More people are definitely getting savvier, of course, to get more specific. And that's what we want to do as well, to get specific in what we search. There is a point where you're going to be too specific. There is a point where you're way too general and way too specific. That's true. So we have to find, you have to find the right spot somewhere here where you're not too specific and you're not too generic, and that's why SEO can be tricky. 
depending on your competition, your keywords, your niche, your product, it's not an exact science. So we're going to develop this sort of keyword strategy, figure out keywords. Oh, look at this. I'm seeing over on Bing. I am seeing a map now. I didn't see a map uh, before, but now I am seeing a map because now I'm getting specific. Now it says, okay, Bing says, well, you probably care about web designers in San Diego. Here's a map of San Diego. You're in San Diego. Here's the gravy designs. Here's affordable webdesign.inc, G4 Design House. Here's affordable business ways, Binary M, Inc. Yes? So is Bing local akin to Google Plus? Yes, Bing has its own example where it wants to focus on local businesses and you are able to also put yourself on their map because Bing has its own map system competing with Google Maps, Bing Maps. So it, knowing this, it would behoove us if I've only taken the time to put myself on Google's map, I should take the time to put myself on Bing's map as well just to get more visibility. So we'll have an activity a little bit later about thinking about developing these in a bit more. We have to figure out some keywords to help us get found, and we'll talk later on about where and how to add them to our website, of course. Uh, but before we get to that point, let me, let, let me mention here three pillars of SEO. We have longevity. Uh, authority, we have content. There are many factors. <coughs> Fancy way to say it is signals. There are many signals. There are many factors. There are many things that the search engines take into account to rank you. Keywords is one of the many things. One thing also that the search engine looks at to rank you is longevity. How long has your website existed? How long has your online presence existed? So, how long have you been online? I had a family business for 20 years and we just got the great idea to put it online last year. My competitor, also being, uh, I don't know, a lawyer, also has been around 20 years, but they built their website a year before us. So they've had a year head start. That does count to some degree. Two websites of the exact same content. Lawyers in Hillcrest. How is the search engine going to rank one higher or lower? Well, what's the older one? So the older one could rank higher. Again, it's not the only factor. There's many factors we'll talk about. But one of them is the longer you exist online, the more the search engine will give you preference over those that are upstarts. Because anyone can create a website anytime. Any spammer can create a website anytime. And therefore the search engine looks at, well, this website just popped up this week, whereas this one's been around for a year. The one about been around a year might be more relevant to people, so it might show it higher. Well, there's no way for you to go back in time at the moment for you to put your website before your competitor. When you create a website, it basically goes into a global registry of every single website, and the date is added to it, and that cannot be changed. No one can change that. We can look up when was a website created. If you had, had ever at some point want to go over to whois.ican.org, you can look up every website in the world, how long it's existed, and other details. And you'll see, oh, my competitor built theirs on January 7th, 2016, and I built mine on February 2nd, 2016. So yeah, one month head start. That has some preference, some pre precedence. But you're not going to be able to make your website older. There's no way for you to change that somewhere or to pay for it or anything like that. Your website exists and it starts at some point and you can't change it. Well, to counteract that, we have these two other signals, these two other factors that the search engines look at. Authority, which is why should you be ranked well, 
which ties into very closely to what are you creating to get found. Content and authority go very hand in hand to counteract longevity if you're lacking it. If you're lacking it. And if you have a lot of longevity and authority and content, even better. So authority. Again, two websites created two years ago. But one website has been updating every month. One website has been blogging every month. One website has been adding a new article every month. The lawyer websites. One lawyer put up their website. It's a great looking website. It's a business card website. But the other lawyer also writes articles about top five tips for beating a DUI, top ten mistakes when hiring an attorney, um, what to do when you reach retirement. You know, one lawyer is writing articles. One order. One lawyer is creating content for the search engines to find and building authority because they are creating that content that the search engines are finding, whereas the other is not. So that's a way that the search engine can rank that one lawyer higher than the other, even though they have this exact same website created at the same time. Question? Um, if you have like a tab that says blog on your website, how did, does the, I guess, like the search engine recognize that you're not just changing the content on the actual homepage? Homepage, and you're actually putting it on your blog? Or yes. Like you can tell the difference? Yes, definitely, because simply changing your home page is not at all what I'm saying. Uh, what, uh, what, are you, what content are you creating and such? It's not just simply changing your home page every few months. It is like you're saying, a blog. It is a section on your site where you're writing something new. And the search engine does know that because it sends its little, it, its little spider, its little program to go to your home page and your about page and your contact page and your blog page and analyze your whole site. So the search engine analyzes everything about your site to determine your ranking. So it'll know when you've got the block. So you just name a blog that's sufficient on your web page? Yeah, that's fine. It'll it'll crawl your site and get to it and understand what kind of content it is. But yeah, naming it as blog, naming it as articles is fine, naming it as news is fine. It's just that just like you saw when I searched my company and it said January 14th, it saw something was updated. The blogs automatically, oftentimes by default, have a date. That's how the search engine sees what's new. So what are you creating to get found? Examples, blogs, which are articles, social media, comments, are people commenting on your site? Are you creating content on your website or off your website? SEO, SEM? Are you creating content on your website, off your website for the search engines to find? Remember when I searched my company website and it found our blog and it found our Yelp and it found our Twitter and it found all of that extra stuff besides the website? Content. And it found us on Yelp. That's authority also. Because Authority is related to content you create about yourself and content others create about you. One is obviously easy. On my website, I have the full power to write articles. What's a little harder is, can someone else write a review about me? Can someone else comment on my site? Can um, someone else tweet about me? Can someone else mention me on Facebook? We'll have a deeper discussion on that, of course, later. Uh, but that's also how you're building authority. What are other people saying about you, good or bad? Because there is some, uh, um, there is some value to those negative Yelp reviews. Let's take a little segue for that. Review sites. This is related to content and authority. Review sites have a value nowadays. I may, I may not like Yelp, and I don't have, don't want anything to do with it. I may not 
uh, like Facebook and want to have nothing to do with it, but the majority of people do. The majority of people like or use Facebook and Yelp and so forth. For example, as a business owner, I might ha hate Yelp because I'm getting so many bad reviews. I don't know why. Uh, but as a user, I love Yelp because I can look up what's a bad restaurant to avoid, what's a bad mechanic to avoid. I'm going to get recommendations and such from my Facebook friends. So all of these review sites have a value because this is helping create content and authority. And you may never want to log into or touch Yelp, but someone else probably did. You don't have to create your account on Yelp. Someone probably did it for you. Someone probably did it for you to trash you, especially if they had a bad experience. But let's keep it positive. Someone created that Yelp account to give you a great review. Someone mentioned you on Facebook in a positive way. So good Yelp reviews are good because they show the rest of the people that you are a good company to work with. Bad Yelp reviews can be good because because that could be an opportunity to turn a negative into a positive. If someone took the time after they had that bad experience in your restaurant to go home and write something negative about you, that's a person that, that, that cared about uh, the experience and such, and that's a person that you can then reach out to and try to figure out what was the problem, how can we fix it, what, what happened, try again. But there's a very fine line here on how to deal with this. Bad reviews can be good, but because you can turn them into good reviews, bad can be turned into good. But the fine line is, but don't bribe for good reviews. Example would be, I have a restaurant. Someone had a bad experience. They found a tooth in the cannoli. So they go home and then they, buy, they write a one-star review and said how terrible the experience was. I, I, uh, I monitor my Yelp account as the business owner and I see someone wrote that. So, okay, sounds terrible. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to reply to the person and say something like, very sorry for your experience. We're, uh, we're going to get to the bottom of the issue. I hope you give us another chance. Leave it at that. You're not going to bribe them by saying, we're so sorry, here's 10% off your next meal. We're so sorry, here's, here's a free dessert next time. We're going to fix the issue. Please come back and tell us and you'll get a free dessert. That's bribing. You're not going to give something for a good review. Because unfortunately, people take advantage of this. People can give you a bad review on Yelp that have never stepped in your store and said, I had a bad experience here, what are you going to do to placate me? And people are going to fall for it and say, oh, sorry, here's 10% off. And they just got 10% off for stepping in the door for the first time. So don't bribe people, even if you <clears throat> mean well. That's obviously the harsh way to say it, but don't bribe people by begging them to give you a good review because you're, they're going to get something out of it if you get something out of it, a good review. You're going to do customer service by you know listening to them, being positive and being apologetic and saying we're going to fix it, that issue's been dealt with, give us another chance, etc. Like that. You're not going to say here's something free for your trouble. Real example. Um, I, have a, I have a client, uh, he's got a couple of businesses. One is a comic book shop down in uh, Mission Valley. And he, he got a review at the end of last year. Someone said, give him a one-star review on, on Google Plus reviews, because there's so many review sites nowadays. I'll list a few in a moment. But he got a bad review on Google Plus. And they said, you know, one star. I was at the shop, and I heard the, um, I, I heard the, uh, the, the teller at the, at the register talking to someone else and saying some really vile, racist things. I'm never coming back to this comic book shop. So, 
the owner called me up and he says, I just got a terrible Yelp review and what do I do about it? And I, and I said, again, you're not going to say, you know, sorry, here's a free comic. We're gonna, you're going to say, well, the views of that ex-employee do not rep represent the views of this business. We're sorry about your experience. We're dealing with it. We hope you get, give us another chance to be your favorite comic shop. Try us again next time. We understand the problem. So simply addressing the problem and such like that and still putting it in their, the ball in their court, that's the best you can do with these review sites. Not 10% off your next Superman comic. It's like, give us a chance to, to do better. We've dealt with the issue. And then, yes, he, he fired that person because, again, he doesn't need that kind of person uh, representing his comic shop. So good reviews, of course, are great because people see how good you are. Bad ones can be turned to good, but be careful that someone is not scamming you for free stuff. What you also want to do with these review sites is keep it public. You can reply to people privately. I would recommend you do it publicly. People will see you're trying to fix the issue. People will see the negative comment and your positive resolution for it, and they'll say, this company's trying. This company hears the clients and is trying to fix things or give them the benefit of the doubt. If you take it to private conversation, no one sees you trying to fix it. They just see the negative comment. And if they never fix it, then you just wasted your time trying to, trying to fix it. But if you kept it public, at least you're showing people you're trying to fix it. You've got Yelp. You've got Angie's List. We've got TripAdvisor, we've got um, Kudzu, we've got the BBB, still around, we've got Yellow Pages, so many review sites out there. Yellow Pages, we've got Google Plus, also Google, also known as Google Local. And uh, Facebook now lets you review businesses too. You don't need to be on all of these or monitor all of these. It's going to depend on your business. But definitely check if you're on Yelp. Again, you don't have to create your Yelp. Someone probably did it for you. And if you don't know it even exists, you don't know all of these bad reviews you're getting that you could have been fixing. Perhaps in order of value would be in this order. Check your Yelp reviews, check your Facebook reviews, check your Google reviews. After that, then you can decide the value of these other ones. I just spoke to a. I just spoke to a person earlier today about an estimate for blinds. He says he gets a lot of his referrals from Yelp and the Better Business Bureau, the BBB reviews there. So for him, it's valuable to keep up to date on the BBB website and Yelp. But if you look yourself up on those three sites, check your reviews, there's a whole process. We won't have, a, we won't have time to get into it in this class. But there's a process of claiming your business on these networks. When you claim your business, then you can fix the, you know, the wrong time that you're open. You can add a description. You can add pictures. And you can answer people's reviews negative or positive. It's also valuable for you to say thank you once in a while for those positive reviews. It shows you again as a real company, not just some some faceless corporation, even if you work out of your garage, it shows you as a real company with real people, even if you reply to the good reviews. Again, don't give anything away saying thank you for that amazing review, have a free cupcake. Don't bribe for good reviews. So this is all related to the authority and content section, a little bit more to authority, because, love it or hate it, a bad Yelp review could be bad for your business. A good Yelp review could be good. A bad star rating on Facebook could be bad for you. Maybe you never logged on to Facebook, you don't like Facebook and such, but people use it. It's the most popular social network. It behooves you to at least dabble in it for the sake of your business even Yelp. And both of those, Facebook, Yelp, Angie's List, all of these, 
they also have a paid version where me as a business I can pay for more placement, for more um, preference and such, but you can get by with the free stuff. Any questions so far? Yes? What about things like um, check-ins or if you hashtag your name? Well, that's, uh, that's uh, check-ins and hashtags and such are kind of a discussion for another day because that has value too, like if hashtags are often on a social network, like people are tweeting and they hashtag your business, let's say. That is content being created that the search engines see and helps you. People checking in on Foursquare or Facebook local and such, that's valuable too. The search engines see that you're active and people are actually visiting your business and such. So there's so many signals, so many factors for positive results with SEO that the more of these that we learn and implement, the better. One is not better than the other or very, very, you know, more powerful than another. So the more that we know about it, the better. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to give you a new document. So when I give you a document, it'll be inside of the network folder. Let me remind you again where the network folder is at. The network folder. On your desktop, minimize your windows, go to the desktop. You want to open the computer window at the top left, double click computer, at the top left of your desktop. You'll see the network location section, classroom data drive Z, double click on classroom data drive Z. Scroll down to find campus SEO, double click the campus SEO folder. And I've got the drawing that I made a little while ago, the long tail keyword strategy. You can get a copy of that if you'd like. And I've also got this client company profile document. You want to drag that to your desktop. Don't just double click it. You want to drag it to your desktop or flash drive. And close the network folder. If everyone is connected at once, it may slow down. So as soon as you copy the client company profile file, close the network so that other people can access it. Let's look at this and talk about this. <coughs> this is a Word document. You should be able to open it on your computer. Just double click it. It's editable. You should be able to take it home and work on it if you want. This is not any sort of assignment. This is not any homework. You're not going to turn this in. Again, in this class, there's no homework. There's no grades, none of that. If you want to do this and you want me to look at it, I'll gladly look at it and give you an opinion. We're not going to really do this completely right now. I'm going to give you an overview of what this is to think about it. I'm going to go into more detail about it later. But the reason I'm giving you this document is because as I said, I teach this, but I do this as part of a company. And when my company gets hired by some other business to get found, or to get a website or whatever, we need to know as much as possible about that company to be able to SEO optimize them. We need to know that company as, as well as, hopefully, the business owners themselves. The business owners obviously know all about their own company. We don't. We're getting hired and we're expected to then become pros in that company to be able to tweet about it, to be able to write blogs about it, to be able to optimize it. So this is a variation of what we do for a client where we develop a company profile. Again, we'll go into detail with it later, but you would fill in your company name if you've got one, put your name, put the date, because this could change 
as you learn more of these concepts, this can change. And again, the point of this is SEO is a big ball of wax. There are a lot of uh, moving parts. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. It's complicated. Not hard, but complicated. And so part of it is knowing the most about your own company. Obviously, if I'm getting hired for your company, I need to know the most about it. But if you're going to do this yourself, you're going to need to know about your company as well to write your keywords, to tweet effectively, to blog effectively for your SEO and SEM endeavors. Next time we'll go into detail, but in general, start to think about these things. You'll read it on your own and then we'll get into details and I'll give examples later. But write about what your company name, why your company name is, do you have a tagline or a slogan? If you don't, you need to perhaps think of one. Do you have any sort of about us information that's going to be used on your website, on your social media? Do you have a mission statement? Why are you in this business? Are there values that define your company? What kind of personality does your company portray? And fundamental information about your business, contact info and all of that. So you're going to look at this, you're going to maybe mull it over the weekend and then when we come back next time we'll look at it in detail together with examples. This is the company profile because we need to attack SEO from multiple angles. This is one of them. Again, this would be something that my company would do for any other company and, and charge a good amount for it because we need to do the best job for that company. For yourself, you need to know the most about your company to get the best results. Any general questions on this, which we'll get to in detail later? All right, so part of what we need to do with SEO, we need to know about our company to optimize it and we need to know about the competition to do better than than them. So let me give you another handout which we will do in depth right now. Let me give you another handout. If you go back to the network folder, I just put in a document there called Campus SEO 1 long tail strategy. Again, go to the network folder, drag that out to your desktop or flash drive. This one we will look at it in detail together. So copy that long tail strategy to your desktop or flash drive and open it up. I'll turn the printer on later. Let's take a look at this document. Forming a long tail keyword strategy. What does your brand offer? Nowadays search engines don't rank your site very well unless you have good content. It's not just about simple keywords anymore. You're not going to be found when people search for Italian restaurants. You will have a better chance of being found with authentic Italian food in Chula Vista. Being specific. You will have a better chance of being found when you're specific. It's the long tail of keywords. If you understand your niche better, your topic, you'll be able to potentially rank better. In this activity, you'll define your long tail keywords. So we're going to do a little bit of competitor analysis and keyword compilation. We're going to see what our competition is and we're going to write we're going to develop some keywords. On a different day, we will then apply those keywords, but we need to first develop them. There's two ways we're going to do this, the old way, generic keywords, and the new way, long tail keywords. So the way we're going to do this is um we're going to use the search engines, Google and Bing, to research the competition. And we're going to write, we're going to write our results. So I would recommend 
go to your start menu and search for Word. We want to use Microsoft Word so we can copy and paste a little bit from the web into a document. You can of course write all of this on paper, but it's going to be easier if you copy and paste this onto a digital document so you can make notes on it and change it easily. Competitor analysis. So click down here on the start menu, search for Word, and then click on Word 2013. You'll get the templates. Just choose the blank document. And we'll go up to the File menu to Save As. Let's go up to this File tab. Click Save As. And again, you want to save this on your flash drive. If you didn't bring one, save it to the desktop. And uh, we'll call this... Um, Competitor analysis. And long tail keyword strategy. This document will have our uh, competitor analysis and our long tail keyword strategy. Again, you can write this on plain old paper or in Word. My handout says, go to a search engine and search a simple keyword from your niche or topic. In my Word document, I'm going to first do generic keyword. Let's say, so I often use this fictional business, Victor's Bakery. I don't really have a bakery, but I do Victor's Bakery. And I want to get found. I want people to find my bakery and buy my cupcakes. So a generic keyword that people might search for Again, we'll do this several ways. First is simply bakery. Some people are just going to type bakery. And again, people are more savvy. But I still want to search this basic way to see what the competition is. Because you won't know what your competition is or what you're up against until you research them. So let's research a basic keyword, bakery. So I'm going to use the, the keyword bakery. I'm going to first go to Google, and I'm not going to get fancy yet. I'm going to search bakery. Bakery, bakeries, it's going to suggest bakery, San Diego, whatever. Ignore that for the moment. The search engines are getting smarter. The web browsers are getting smarter. I simply search bakery, but it's not really oftentimes going to give me a result over in Kansas. Because these web browsers, Google Chrome in my example, or Firefox, or Safari, oftentimes they're actually giving out a lot of information that you might not realize. Your web browser, your computer, is telling websites where your general location is, oftentimes. If you don't know that, oftentimes our, you know, our computer is giving away information. That's the basic nature of it. So it kind of knows, okay, you probably mean bakeries in San Diego. I kind of know your general location, even though I didn't specify. That's fine. But in my case, it's giving me bread and side, Panchita's Bakery. And what my activity here is I'm checking the competition. And as I said, some people, you might get ads. You're going to skip all the ads. Don't choose any ad because, of course, they've paid for placement. You can choose to skip the spotlight, if you get a spotlight result, because some people are also going to think that's an ad. I want to find results that are of real businesses. So skipping all of that, I see the best, the top 10 best bakeries on Yelp. I'm going to skip that too. I want to see a result of a real business. Yelp again, skip it. San Diego List, skip it. San Diego Tribune, skip it. Edelweiss Bakery. That's the first result in my case. It's like the fifth result. This is the first result that's a real bakery. What I want to do is select that block of information from that competitor, right click and copy. 
and in Word I want to paste it. But because we're pasting in Word, I recommend right click and select this third paste option right there. If you simply control C, control V to paste, it's going to come in with all of the colors and the link and all of that distracting stuff. I recommend that you paste, right click, and select to paste text only, just to focus on the content. Yes? So let's say we can use this of champion with a <clears throat> for the first time of Google. You page through a couple of pages and found a white statement. Mm -hmm. You click on it. The next time you go back to Google and search San Diego Bakery, AOS Bakery will come up first because it remembers that you clicked on it, right? Yes, and we're getting ahead of, no, ahead of ourselves. Yes, and we're getting ahead of ourselves because the second way that we're going to search will address that exactly. So we'll get to that in a moment. So here what we're doing is we're searching. We're searching for a basic keyword and I'm getting a result of a real business, and I'm going to do reconnaissance. I'm going to check on the competition. The first result, in my case, is Edelweiss Bakery. And I'm, I'm going to make notes here. My, my sheet is saying that for the first page of results, write or copy and paste the title and description from each site. I'm going to compile a list of some of these competitors. The first item that comes from a results page is the title. The next line is the URL or the address of the site. And the third result that uh, the third item of the result is the description. So the reason I'm writing this in Word is so that I can write this stuff. If I'm writing it on paper, well, it's a little low tech, so I'm writing this in Word so I can make notes and highlights and all of the good stuff. But every result in Google or Bing is going to be something like this, a variation. A result of a competitor which has a title, a URL, and a description. We have the ability to edit all of those because this is our first chance to make our first impression. What was that one product from a few years ago that their slogan was, you only get one chance to make a first impression? It was like Listerine or gum or something. You only get one chance to make a first impression. So here, this is your first chance to make the first impression when someone searches. I get a bunch of results. Someone sees Edelweiss Bakery, and I can tell from the title what they're about. They're a bakery. And from their address, it's kind of long and, and difficult to, to read and spell, but I see bakery in there. But then the description, Edelweiss Bakery in Rancho Bernardo, a full-service European bakery. Family owned and operated, specializing in European style baked goods, wedding, dot dot dot. I search the keyword bakery and the first result has the keyword bakery in the title, in the address, but not in the description. And that's okay. I don't have to have the keyword on all three of those places, as we saw here from the number one result. Does it kind of have bakery in the description? Because it James itself, Edelweiss Bakery, and Renshinardo are a full-service European bakery. Oh, sorry, yes. It's getting late in the day, I guess. Yes, there's a bakery right there. Sorry. It's right there, yes. Yes, yes so they have bakery in all three things. Um, but it's very common to not have those keywords in all the spots. In this case, yes, it did have it on all. Um, so... notes here. Used um, bakery in all three. Title, URL, description. In this case, this competitor used the keyword in all three. That could be a factor why they ranked higher. Let's see some more here. Skipping that news item there, skipping Wikipedia. Okay, I see another result here. Twigs Bakery. That seems to be a real result, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back to Word and paste it. Paste as text. In the title, Twigs has the keyword bakery. 
the address does not. It simply says twigs. If I take twigs out of this and I showed the the website twigs.org to someone, they could they could have an idea of what it is. You know here that it's a bakery because it says bakery. But if you saw twigs all by itself, what would you think it is? A nature um, health food store, a uh, you know um, nature adventure uh, travel agency. I don't know. It's, it could be any number of things just with its name. But it's the second result. The description then says, Twigs is a boutique bakery specializing in cakes for all occasions, weddings, birthdays, and parties. We have two cafes, coffee houses in the university, and then it gets cut off. But I'm seeing two common things, wedding over on Edelweiss and weddings over on Twigs. So as I do more research, is weddings a common keyword that these are using? Am I using it? Do I do that? Does my bakery do weddings? I forgot to add weddings anywhere to my keywords and such. Perhaps that's why they're ranking higher than me. So making a note here, didn't use bakery in URL, which is okay. You don't have to have your keywords in your address anymore. I'm going to write this on my other note, actually. Uh, I want to say, be careful. You can over-optimize. You can go the other way, unfortunately. You learn all the tips and tricks of SEO, and you go overboard, and you do every single one of them, and you you over-optimize. Um, that can happen. Because if we think of our keyword as bakery, and I put bakery on my title, in my address, in my description, on my home page, on my footer, in my about page, in my contact page, if I'm putting bakery over and over and over and over without a real purpose to it, just to get ranked because I'm using that keyword, that can be over-optimization. I can be abusing the system now. It's very easy for you to go overboard with optimization sometimes because that's what the spammers do. The spammers over-optimize. The spammers know all of these techniques and try to abuse them and try to rank higher. Is there something wrong with using the system? Like totally. If like you, ethically or...? No, who cares about ethics? We care, we care about Google. Yeah. It's bad for Google, definitely. Because if, if your website seems like a spam website, you get marked as a spam website and you drop down. If you do techniques that seem like you're a spammer, the, the search engines really nowadays, because there's so much spam out there, the search engines now are really strict. And so, um, you know, if you, if you hang out with spammers, if you act like a spammer, you'll get marked as a spammer. If you do techniques like spammers, you'll get marked as a spammer. It's like guilty until proven innocent for the search engines. It's guilt by association with the search engines nowadays. So ethically, that's one thing. But search engine-wise, you don't want to use these some of these techniques, which I'll point them out, of course, over-optimizing. Don't over-optimize. Don't engage in black hat SEO. Do engage in white hat SEO. Black hat SEO, white hat SEO. This comes from the terms uh, of the classic cowboy movies. When the bad guys came into town and shot up the place and took over, what kind of color hat were they wearing? Black hat. When the sheriff came into town to clean it up, what kind of hat was he wearing? White hat. So good techniques are white hat SEO, bad techniques are black hat SEO. And because there is a middle ground, there is gray hat SEO. That one also you should avoid. Gray hat SEO is techniques that perhaps are at the moment not negative, haven't been abused, but might not be the best to do. I'm going to say avoid. Gray hat SEO. 
This class is all about white hat SEO, of course. This class is all about the best techniques that will get you ranked that don't abuse the system, because abusing the system might work in the short term, but then you're labeled, you get that scarlet letter of black hat SEO, of spammer, and then it's going to be hard to get out of page 40. And then next week you're on page 50. Next page you're on 140. It's going to be hard to get back up to the top because there's so much spam out there. It's better for the search engines, easier for the search engines to just bury you there, to bury the spammers and promote the ones that are doing it the right way. What I'm getting at back to this, you don't have to overuse your bakery keyword everywhere. I'm not going to put it in my address and my title and my description and the first paragraph and the second paragraph and the footer and the about page. That was the old techniques. That was when, when Yahoo reigned supreme. Yahoo would analyze your website and see this website mentioned bakery 40 times. This bakery mentioned website uh, bakery only, only uh, 20 times. The 41 will rank it higher and the 21 will rank it lower. When the search engines weren't as sophisticated, that was one way to rank well a website. It didn't know any better. The spammer said, oh, it looks like the more times we mention bakery, the better. So I'm going to mention bakery 200 times, and it got to number one. But then the search engine improved, more came out, and they said, okay, it's not just the keyword is, are you on Twitter? Are you on Facebook? Are you on blogging? All of this stuff to help prevent the spammers. And the spammers still figure out how to abuse the system. So we'll talk about of course, how to not do it the wrong way. But this activity is to see what the competition is doing. What are they doing right? And they're probably doing a lot right because they are the highest ranked organic results. Here's one more. Sugar and, sugar and scribe bakery and fine food. La Jolla Bakery. They did use bakery twice in their title. I've got another result here. <coughs> Sugar and Scribe Bakery and Fine Food, La Jolla. Their URL, their address is simply Sugar and Scribe. Doesn't say the keyword bakery. Their description Come try the only bakery in La Jolla. We offer a fresh daily menu of cupcakes, cakes, sweet and savory pies, Irish specialty foods quiche and gourmet to go. They don't mention weddings. But they still got to third 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 page, third result. So that, that doesn't look so good, but notice that's not so bad that they're number forty. They're still number three. So I'm building this reconnaissance. Um, again, two of the top three did not put bakery in their title. What that means is it's not as important as it used to be to put your keywords in your title. Not as important. What's that? I'm sorry, not the title, the, the address the address of the website. It comes from the individual page, like the home page or the about page and such. Yes, these are the home page titles, usually, 99% uh, of the time. So Twigs Bakery is coming from the home page and so forth. Yes? Does it matter if the word before or after the niche is capitalized? Formatting and such? Right. No, it's not as important. Um, so you see some companies have like a capital letter, and other companies don't. Some have a comma to separate the words. Yeah, so not as important, not as important the order of your keywords or the capitalization or special characters. It used to be much more important. Someone would search for La Jolla Bakery. And I had put in my description, Bakery in La Jolla. 
so I wouldn't be found. But the search engines are in that sense a little more lenient that as long as I've got La Jolla and Bakery in my keywords, it'll understand it. It doesn't have to be exactly La Jolla Bakery. So the order is not as important, nor the capitalization or special characters, dashes and commas and such. Not as important the order of those. But I was getting at, not as important to have your keywords in your URL anymore. Oftentimes, uh, oftentimes, um, this actually hurts you. So let's say I am, I, I wanted to get, of course, bakery.com. Someone snagged that up 20 years ago, literally. Websites have been around 27 years. Okay, so I'm going to go with uh, San Diego Bakery. Someone took that too, probably. Okay, I'm going to go with San Diego Dash Bakery. Someone took that. Okay, I'm going to go with San Diego Dash Bakery. Someone took that. Okay, I'm going to go with the original San Diego Bakery. Someone didn't take that. I still wouldn't claim that address. This is starting to look spammy. Maybe not to you, but to the search engines. Because I wanted this generic keyword and I fought for it with these variations, to the search engines, this is starting to verge on spam. Because that's what the spammers do. You've seen websites that are authentic, affordable Rolex.com, uh, cheap Canadian meds.net real Michael Kors handbags.org. You've seen more and more of these kinds of websites that have that keyword in their title and then they're spammers. So you don't need to get a kind of address like this anymore. Not necessary. Like before. Before it was, because how else is the, is the search engine going to tell that you're a legitimate original San Diego bakery? But not anymore, because anyone can make any website with any name. So nowadays, it's okay to have any URL. We saw twigs.org, number two. It had nothing about bakery, La Jolla, San Diego. It didn't have anything specific. That's just fine. They're number two. The other one over here, Sugar and Scribe. I guess sugar might lead me toward bakery and such, or I might think of it in a different term. Scribe, to me, sounds like a writer. Is this a blogger writing about recipes? So twigs.org, Sugar and Scribe. They don't have the keyword bakery, but they're number two and three, respectively. And before you, before you knew what it was, what the heck is a Facebook? What's a Twitter? What's a Pinterest? What's a Google? Before you knew what these things are, you didn't know what these things were just by the name. It's not called the search engine google.com. It's Google. It's not called shareyourpicturespinterest.com. It's Pinterest. Obviously, we're not Pinterest level. We're not Twitter level. Maybe one day you will. You will be. But the point is, you don't need a, a specific name like before. What the heck is a PMD Interactive? Do they make video games? Mm -hmm. So the point is, you don't have to have an exact match domain. You don't have to have an EMD, exact match domain. You simply say, you don't have to have your keywords in your domain anymore. There's nothing here about web design. There's nothing here about social media. It doesn't matter because you're going to use your keywords elsewhere. You're going to create content. You're going to create authority. You're going to exist longer with many other factors, and that'll help you get found and ranked when someone is searching for, uh, we got a job recently to do some photo retouching for someone. They had searched. We asked them, what did you search for? And they said, well, I searched for uh, Photoshop designers in San Diego. And that's how they found us. 
because somewhere in our website we had those keywords in our portfolio most likely we had Photoshop work uh, you know Photoshop work portfolio and such and they found the keyword and they found us and they called us and they hired us and we did a job that way we don't have Photoshop web designers.com we got found for that for one of the things we do so not necessary EDM not necessary if you've got a website that has an exact match domain I'm not saying get rid of it and if you have it you have it but if you're thinking of uh, building a website you don't have to beat yourself up to get the, the 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 website with all of your keywords because they're gonna change and you're not just gonna have one keyword that you base yourself on you're gonna have dozens of keywords and you're not gonna make a 300 letter long address with all your keywords Flickr.com, Kickstarter.com, you know, these sorts of names. What do they mean without the with, without the rest of their, their meaning? Fiverr, yes, with two R's. Anyone know what Fiverr.com is? This is a website where you can go hire a person to do a job for you for five dollars. You can have someone design a logo <coughs> for you for five dollars. You can have someone write you a song for five dollars. You know, but you get what you pay for. So, <laughs> a lot of the people selling their work here, though, they say, okay, for five dollars you'll get a nice, really cool, basic one. But for five dollars more, you get this, and for ten dollars more, you'll get it in a week instead of a month, and so forth. But you wouldn't know what that's about at all until you click and view it, but they, they built up a presence online. So the point is you're going to build a presence. Whatever the name of your business is, your website, you're going to build a, a presence for it. You're going to build content, authority, the longer you do it. So um, in these examples here, I've gathered a few of them further back on my handout. I'm gathering a little information, I'm writing a couple notes, whatever comes to mind. Then I'm going to click on those results, as many as I want, but I listed here three. And I'm going to click, and yes, I'm going to give them a free click, I'm going to give them a little traffic, I'm going to go to their site. But then the point of that is to then do more reconnaissance, to see, well, what does this site have? What does it have that mine doesn't have? What are they doing right that I'm not doing right? What do I like about them? What do I don't like about them? What do I not like about them? Here's some example questions to think about because you may not have the terminology of a web designer and, and that's fine. Whatever comes to mind. But here's ideas. When was the page updated? Can you find somewhere on the site when was it last updated? Mine was updated a year ago. Theirs was updated six months ago. It's newer. Does it have a blog? I'm not writing anything, any articles on my site, but they are writing at least one new thing every two months. New content for the search engines to find. My design is old and creaky, and I did it in Dreamweaver six years ago, and they built theirs in Wix, much more new and modern, and look at how nice it looks. The search engines look at all of that stuff too. Is your website nice? If it's old and old technology and hard to navigate and broken links, that hurts you too. There's a lot of things that help and hurt you. Is the site mobile friendly? That's a big one now. More and more people use a mobile device. I'm out on the street. I need to find a business, restaurant, whatever. I look it up here. I go to their website. I, I get what I want quickly from here. I'm not at a computer where I can see the website on a nice big monitor. I have a tiny little monitor to look at the website. One quick way to, to tell if a website is mobile friendly is, have you been to a website, it loads up and the text is tiny, you have to zoom in to it? That often means it's not mobile friendly. So if your website, if someone goes to it on their phone and they have to zoom into it, most likely it's not mobile friendly. And that's becoming a factor much more nowadays that will penalize you if your website is not mobile friendly. And then uh, you're going to 
subjectively than write about what do you like about it, what don't you like about it. They're your competitor and you hate them. But what did you what did they do well on their site and what did they not do well? Question. It's going to depend on the website itself. Let me let me take an example here if I can find that. I'm going to click on Edelweiss Bakery. And let's see what comes up here. Depending on how they design their site and such, they may make it obvious or not. It's There's no standard to see when it was updated. Oftentimes you'll see it in a blog or you'll see it perhaps on the footer. The footer is down at the bottom of the page. I don't see it on Edelweiss easily. Maybe it's somewhere else. Um, so I can't quite tell off the bat for this business when it was last updated. But that might not be a big factor why they're number one. Maybe their design is what's making them number one. Maybe their keywords or other factors. Let me see perhaps over on Twigs. Different kind of design. 2016. I see a date right there. Copyright 2016. Perhaps that's an indicator of when last updated. <clears throat> most likely most likely this is a little bit of branding about who did the website and oftentimes a company will take a little credit like that in the footer so succeed get it succeed and they've got a blog and such okay so I'm gonna click on some of these and see what they're about I've got a, a monitor that's kinda zoomed in just so that you guys can see it so the website I'm seeing it here way too big if I zoom out a little bit, it's supposed to look more like that. But I'm looking at it, it's uh, pleasant pastel colors, nice big graphics, relevant information early on, phone number. I'm just going to, again, I might not have the experience or the terminology of a, of a web designer and such, but I'm just going to write my gut feeling about the site, what's good, what's bad. Uh, I have some examples there in the handout, but just to show you. Um, one of the most important things that I see early on is a phone number, some sort of contact information. I'm probably going to see that often on most of these number one results. Contact information is very easy to get found. Whoops, I put my phone number on the about page. Someone needs to go from the home page to the about page to see my phone number. Does it make sense for you to put your contact information, like a phone number, as soon as possible on your site? There's a menu up here to go look at fact. Seems to be uh, pretty, even though I don't see a date, I do see here menu for Father's Day. They seem to be up to date with that. Here's our Father's Day menu. It's not that obvious, but the search engine can look at things deeper than, than me and faster than me. That's one reason why they're up to date. They've got a Father's Day menu. I don't I don't think I might see that over on Twigs. When you talk about updating a site, does that have to be something really qualitative or can it be as much as changing a word or no, we did mention that briefly earlier, and we'll get into it deeper. It's not just simply changing your words or your design and moving your pictures around. That's not a change. Your change is going to be something much, much more tangible, like content, like blogs and, and, and products, but usually blogs. And I see this place as a blog right there. New articles. It hasn't been updated that recently. But it has content. It has this. These blogs, in short, are valuable also because they're full of keywords. People are searching, and maybe decorate decorations and deliveries. And there's a keyword in that article. But when you don't update it, you have terrible videos. Yes, but 2014 stuff like that you see all the time. Yeah, people. People start to blog and they give up easily on it because they don't feel it's useful to them. But it is one of the secrets. If you are if you are up active on your blog, they were active for a long time. October, I mean August 2011. All of them. They quit. They quit eventually. So 
But still, they might have built up enough content after all of this time that helps them get found, which negates that it's not that current. So the point of this is to check out the competition and make notes. Um, I'm going to say, for example, on Edelweiss, lots of graphics showing off the product. Contact info. The like, phone number is right at the top, so easy to access. So they really promote their products. They really show off, wow, look at that cake. It looks like a real glove. Um, it looks like a really nice uh, wedding cake right there, custom wedding, apple strudel. So they're really promoting their, their products. Some negatives that I would say is maybe it's a little too busy. Too many graphics, too many fonts. No. What's that? Too many colors. All of these are fighting for my attention. That's something I'm going to write down. I could say perhaps site too busy. I'm still in the section about the old way right here. I'm just doing it's number three. I, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the results and just writing notes about the results. So obviously I could go into a lot of detail with this. But uh, you're going to look at your competition. This is something that we do for, for our clients. We go in and we, uh, we uh, check you know, half a dozen or more competitors. You're always going to have a competitor, unfortunately. Uh, and you're going to look at these keywords are working for these people. Why is it working? Look at their site. Uh, write these notes, good and the bad. Uh, site too busy, too many fonts and colors. Try to be critical. I'm going to do that to as many as I as I want or I can. In the handout, it says do this for three. Let's see what they're about. And this has a value to see what's working for the for the competition. Uh, I'm going to move on to the new way in a moment. But any questions so far? Yes. Very true. Very true. The the design is is, is going to be uh, dictated by its business. by its business. So form does follow function. So it might be okay for a children's business to have lots of fonts and colors and that, but not for an accounting company maybe. The second part of this activity is the new way. This addresses the question from earlier. You might have noticed, as you search, your results start to get skewed. Not that the search engine or the web browser is trying to trick you, but the, the web browsers usually are trying to help you. If you visit over and over certain websites, if I visit my bank often, if I start to go to bankofamerica.com often, as I start to type BA, and it starts to suggest right away, Bank of America. It's trying to help me. As I search for things over and over, I go to Bing and constantly search about tech news. So it's going to give me perhaps certain results over and over. That's just the way it works. It usually helps. For us, for this activity, it's not. For this activity, it's skewing our results. So that's why the second way to do this in a clean search engine, search for a long tail keyword. What this is saying, the note, number one, the note down here, a clean search engine is one where you have reset your web browser. I recommend cleaning out all the cookies and browsing history before using the search engine. So people come to me all the time and say, 
you know, I search, I did my long tail keywords, they're specific, and I search, and I come up. But then when I go to my friend's house, I'm on page 12. Well, when I come to this class, I'm, I don't rank well. Why? Again, the search engine and the web browser starts to remember you, starts to remember your search history, because usually that helps you. But in our case, it's, it's blinding us to real results, and your, com your real client has never searched for you before, so they're going to get different results than you. What I'm saying here is, depending on your web browser, somehow, your favorite web browser, somewhere, you need to go to the settings somewhere and figure out how to clean out the cookies, how to reset the history, how to, how to clean it up to get you the best, most generic or, or plain results like your, like your potential clients would be searching for, without the baggage of your history. I'm saying further on this note, Private uh, browsing is also helpful. Depending on your browser, you might have a button that says something like private window, incognito mode, in private browsing, whatever they call it. They all call it different things. And the purpose of this kind of mode is it says when you're browsing privately, it will not save your history and your searches and cookies. So you have to figure out on your browser, your favorite browser, how to do that. And I recommend to do both. Figure out how do you clean up the cookies and how do you go to private mode? Because just because I go to private mode doesn't mean it forgot everything that I, that I did. Because as I was searching, I did it over here. If I go to private mode over here, it still remembered I went to Twigs. So don't get lulled into simply going into private mode and searching. Clean out your cookies, clean out your history, then go to private mode so that you have this blank slate of a search engine to really search like your clients would. And before you do that, of course, cleaning out your cookies and all of that will probably reset your login information. I'm using my browser to log into my bank, and I, and I don't remember my password. I just clicked login because the browser remembered. When I go to my email, I just click log in, it remembered. But if I'm asking you to reset your browser and clean your cookies, it's going to forget all of that. So, furthermore on my instructions, I recommend having a web browser just for these types of searches, just for clean searches. This is important to get results like how your potential visitors or customers would. If I use Safari all day long, and all my passwords are saved into it, and you reset your Safari, you'll have to log into everything again, and you probably don't remember your passwords, that's why you do auto-login. So instead, download for free Chrome, Firefox, Opera, whatever, some other browser. We've got all the popular ones right here. If you're using Safari all the time, download Firefox for free and learn how to go to private mode, learn how to reset it, so that you can do the long tail keyword um, reconnaissance. Because this way I will get results like someone searching for the very first time without the baggage of my own personal computer's history. In my case I have not touched so far today Internet Explorer. It's got a clean history. So if I launch Internet Explorer, different web browser, to do the new tail, uh, the new way long tail keyword search. I'm going to go over to Bing. And then I'm going to go here, as I say, uh, now I'm going to search for a long tail keyword. And now I'm going to be more specific. I searched for bakery. But what if I now search for um, San Diego Bakery for custom cakes. Being more specific. The specific is just basically the long tail keyword strategy. Again, avoiding all the ads. Avoiding all the ads and trying to get to the, to the real results. <clears throat> I could go check out Cute Bakery, sure, but I'm going to skip those again. I'm just going to go look at um, 
Victor? Yes. The three shops and the boxes, are they app sponsored? No, usually those are coming from Google Plus or Yelp or something like that. So I'm going to skip the knot. It seems to be like a resource to find wedding cakes. I'm going to skip Yelp, skip Yelp. I see cutecakes-sd.com. I see twigs. There's twigs again from being specific. I don't see Edelweiss. Twigs is listed twice. Very good. I see sweetcheeksbaking.com. I see grovepastryshop.com. Again, the keyword of of uh, specifically San Diego Bakery custom cakes doesn't have to be in the title or the address maybe even not even in the description but somewhere in the content of your site flowerpower.com flowerpower bakery flowerpower cakes bakes custom cakes for any occasion flowerpower has earned a well-known and respected reputation with San Diego's finest venues Grove Pastry Shop, wedding cakes and specialty cakes. So as I do this research, I'm seeing what are the keywords that other people are using uh, commonly, what are those that they're not being used commonly, how are they writing these descriptions, innovative design, Grove will design the wedding cake, anniversary cake, or novelty birthday cake to fit. Question. I'm sorry, I'm really confused a little bit. Who writes the description? We'll have a day when we'll do it, but we can do it. On our website, we can go in and write that description on our on our own website. And then it pulls it from the website? Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be a meta tag, yeah. So uh, if, if we have our login information and such for a later day, we'll be able to log into our website and see where to edit that. Because we're compiling all those keywords, we want to add them to our site. Such as here, we are able to do that. So that's exactly the meta tag. Yeah, this is most likely the meta so description tag. So if we look at their HTML, we see that. Most likely, but depending on various factors, it could also be getting it like from the first paragraph of the main body content. Does this come from the homepage? It could. It often comes from the home page either from the meta description, which again we'll see what that is later, or like from the first paragraph of the text on the home page. I haven't seen this too much, but look at this. This one, Sweet Cheeks Baking, lists in this description here their address. These other ones don't exactly list it, but that's not good or bad, I'm just saying right away they've listed where their address is and maybe what if they had put a phone number there maybe they succeeded by someone simply seeing the result a description a phone number and someone calls maybe a person doesn't even click that's something to think about when we edit our descriptions later you'll have to think what do you want to put here because this is your first chance to make your first impression and if you can write within the space limitation here what your business is and some sort of contact info that could be very valuable to you. Phone number, address, whatever. Um, so I'm just going to drag and copy this one because uh, back in my Word document this whole section was my generic this whole section was my generic keyword. But then I'm going to make another section down here, and this will be the long tail keyword, which I searched for San Diego Bakery for custom cakes. And the first result, one of the results that I saw was Sweet Cheeks. So I'm going to copy that and paste it and do the same thing as I did for the generic keyword. I'm going to write what I see is good and bad about it. I'm going to 
um, click to view the results, I have some example questions to ask yourself here on that section. For example, uh, I say here, so click on some results, write some notes. For example, does it have social media? Does it have a contact form, contact information? Does it have, uh, does that have a feature your site doesn't? What would you do differently? Maybe this site is really good, but I don't like that it doesn't have a phone number. So objectively, subjectively, you're going to analyze the competition. You're doing competitor analysis here to help you develop, figure out keywords. So I will click there, so this one doesn't go crazy with fonts. It's got a couple of fonts, nice and readable, showing off the pictures, lots of text here. Keywords, they mentioned bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, quinceañeras. People could be searching for those, quinceañera bakery. First birthday smash cakes, bachelorette cakes, um, a link for pricing, copyright 2016, an email and, a, and an address and a phone number. They managed to get 619269cake. They're on Facebook. We have search, contact, a blog. Updated March 30th. Much uh, more recent, perhaps, than the competition. Great. Lots of photos again here. Wow, that's a cake. So just making notes on that. Um, you say clean home page. It's not so busy and cluttered and um, has a blog, has a recent blog, has Facebook. Mine doesn't have Facebook. I've spent all this time on building this website for our business. I didn't think about Twitter, I didn't think about Facebook, Instagram, etc. That's a deeper discussion for another day, but in short, it is valuable for you to also have a presence on social media. Maybe you're not going to blog, maybe you don't have the time for writing long articles, but once in a while you can tweet. You can send off a photo of that product and then say a little sentence about it with a link, and that could be content that could be found and get you traffic to your website. Maybe you post on Instagram, share a little 15 second video on Instagram showing your cake from different sides and then writing something like, you know, click our shop page. Someone sees it on Instagram, they click, they follow the link, more traffic to your site. So if you're only on a website, that's half the story now. That's just SEO. If you're also on social media, that's SEM. What are you doing outside of your website? Yes, more work but it could be more reward. That's why search engine marketing is a full-time job. Our company could get hired to build a website and end it there. But we then say, you need social media, you need SEO, let's add more to it, here's a proposal, etc. And throughout the course, I'll show examples of real clients. But this is one thing that we would do for the client Here's something that you should do at your own pace. Once you've done this reconnaissance, then you're going to start to develop a list of 10 simple keywords. You're not going to hang yourself, hang your hat just on bakery. You're going to have bakery, cupcake, wedding, basic keywords. You're going to have affordable bakery. You're going to have wedding, wedding cake planners in San Diego. You're going to have gluten-free alternatives. Uh, cupcakes. You're going to have all of these 
simple and long keywords to help you get found. Later on we'll talk about where do they go, how do you use them, but you have to find them out first. By researching the competition you are seeing what has worked for them, you are defining what sets you apart and what you have to offer in contrast to your competition. You will use your long tail keywords throughout your site in posts and pages, and we'll see it together. But you will also create content that fits the overall theme, like writing articles and blogs with that keyword that I thought of. You will become an authority in your field you've targeted. You will create content on a regular basis. Tweet, Facebook post. You will spread this content throughout the internet. You know, share it via email. Um, put it on Pinterest. And the book one of the optional books that I recommend has a whole great chapter about that, and I'll show you an excerpt about it later. But there's a link to go check out the book on your own. And we're going to see that really all of these things that we've been talking about really rely upon content. As the spammers abuse the system, the thing that they have a harder time abusing is content. What have you? tweeted? What have you blogged about? What have you put on your home page? What have you created to help you get found? Content. That one always trumps everything. So, <coughs> content. Uh, as we wrap up then for the day, any, any questions so far? A lot to think about, of course, but we have three weeks to, to look at different nuances of this and specific aspects of it. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the main lecture at this point. Final question? Do you have videos now? Do you have YouTube videos on your website? Yeah, that's the new frontier of all of this. YouTube videos. It's more SEM. Maybe a 30-second video or a you know two-minute long video. That has some value. People are going to YouTube more and more to search. People don't think about it this way, but YouTube is perhaps becoming the new search engine. YouTube is becoming the, the new social network. People go there to look up everything. You know, how to bake a pie. And guess what? I made a video on how to bake a pie. And in the description, I wrote a link back to my website to buy our pie. That could give us traffic. In the social media class, we talk about the value of YouTube, for example. So we'll see that we have a lot to think about. I'm going to put my notes in the network folder in just a moment. We're going to wrap up and have a little bit of lab time. Usually we get a little bit more for some one-on-one -on -one help. But we're going to wrap up, and um, we'll do it again next week. There's still more to learn. Come with your password next week and your questions. And we'll do it again next time. Thank you for coming.